My dear friends, today we have a special program because I have a very special guest. I only know him for a little over half a century. We both arrived at the same time in Caracas, Venezuela in 1967, where Rabbi Eisenberg, Rabbi Isidoro Eisenberg, who's my guest today, he served as a rabbi in the Bene Brits for seven years. And to this very day, those of that generation, the young people with whom he dealt then, but they're 60, 65 today, they remember him very well because he left a very important imprint in the Jewish community in Venezuela. However, he did something special, and I'd like to delve on that today. Rabbi Eisenberg, welcome. Thank you very nice much for having again. me here. Nice same to see here. you again. We're here. both in Miami right now. Right. We're both retired now. The weather more or less like the one in Caracas. Ah, very, <laughs> very well said. But I don't want to speak about Caracas. Everybody knows where Caracas is. There is a little place called Coro. I knew about it, but I understand you were looking for something of what? What were you doing in Coro? Why were you so interested in Coro? Uh, I was interested because as a historian by training, when we came to Venezuela, I was immediately brought about thinking, how does this community start? How, where are the origins of the community? And I remember then turning to one of our members of the Bnei Brit, uh, his name was Samuel Zabner Alafa Shalom, and uh, his wife Ducy, may she live till 120. And we turned to them and we said, Samuel, where, where did it all start? And he said to me, you know, all started in a little town on the coast, about a couple of miles from here, uh, by the name of Coro, a little city. A couple of hundred miles. A hundred, hundred miles. Uh, and uh, on the coast, and my parents, in fact, established themselves in Coro. I am from Coro originally, he said. So we said, would you take us there? He said, but with pleasure. And we arranged a trip, and he took us there, and uh, our eyes were opened by what we saw, a small colonial town in the middle of nowhere, and in the outskirts of the town, a cemetery, a Jewish cemetery. And as we started digging into the past of the community, it turns out that this is the very first Jewish cemetery that was established in the whole of Latin America, from Tierra del Fuego to the Rio Grande, as a, an official established Jewish cemetery. It's older than the cemetery in Curacao? No, I said in Latin America, Spanish-speaking America, although I have to include Brazil, no, of course. Yes, to... yes, it's true. I exclude, Latin, yes. I exclude the Caribbean. Okay. All right. Just so our... No, no, no. Like I exclude the Caribbean. But okay. whatever was Spanish or Portuguese, okay. that in was... In South America. In South America, Central America, and Mexico, of course. Uh, Oh, wherever you went, this is this little town, the very first cemetery. And as it happens, the reason for it is because Simon Bolivar himself, in the early 1820s, officially proclaimed that Jews are free to establish themselves in the Gran Colombia, as it was called in those days, which encompassed Colombia and Venezuela, and part of Panama, and they are free to come, settle there, and to establish their synagogues, not openly as a synagogue, but inside a home. And that's why they did it in La Casa Senior, as it is known to this day. One of the people in the community was by the name of Senior, and he gave one of the rooms of his rather large house to be used as a synagogue, and that's as far as we know where the Jews in Koro worshipped on Shabbat and on the holidays. In fact, not long ago, a year or two years ago, a mikra was discovered in the same house, which when I was doing the research we didn't even know that such a thing exists. So that's how this community uh, established itself. And it, it is really important in the sense that it is the first one in the whole continent. And made up 
only of Sephardim. Let us keep in mind, because when I point this out to people, they don't realize that there were no Ashkenazim in the Latin American or Spanish-speaking, Portuguese-speaking America. They were here and there individuals. But by and large, these were only and exclusively Sephardim. Not Sephardim from North Africa, but Sephardim originally from the Caribbean islands and from Holland. But basically, it came from Curacao, man. No? Yes, from yeah, that's yeah. Like the Caribbean islands, from Curacao. Who but came it's from right the... across, very close. Right, right. and yes. who came from Holland, of course. And they came because Curacao became a Dutch possession. And by the way, it's also, also, also important to point out that the great majority of those who came were men because they were looking to make a living. Uh -huh. Did they marry local women? <laughs> Good question. In fact, many did not. Many did and many did not. Let me add that only in the last five years and for the first time, I came across by pure coincidence a book by a Curacao Jew, David Dario Salas is his name, who wrote a number of novels. And there is a novel by the name of Josefina, as far as I know, I wrote an article about it. It is the first novel ever written in Latin America that openly speaks about a marriage of a Jew and a non-Jew. And this we are talking about the late 1800s. Well, it has repeated itself. Yes, well, but as, a, as an historical precedent, let's put it this way, as far as I know, Galdos wrote something, of Maria was written. It also has to do with a Jew and a non-Jew, but it is not as openly, as clear as this novel, totally unknown. By the way, Dario Salas never became a, a, an extraordinary author, but from an historical point of view, it's a precedent. Well, we know that the Spaniards that conquered uh, different countries, Peru, the Portuguese, all these uh, adventurers came without women. Yeah, so yeah. eventually yeah, they, exactly. they had to marry exactly. women. I, I wanted to ask you something that I found interesting because I went there also afterwards, yes, not, yes, not, yes, yes, not sure. before you. Sure. I, I went to the Jewish cemetery right. and I saw that some uh, graves had little angels. Right. Where do we? We right. don't do figures. Right. In fact, uh, Koreanos, Jewish Koreanos that I met in 1968, there were maybe four or five left at that time, called it El Rincón de los Ángeles, the corner of the angels. And it is unique as far as I know, from all the cemeteries that I've ever seen, certainly in the Caribbean, I haven't seen every cemetery, Jewish cemetery in the world, but from those that I've seen, this is very, very unique. And it is a sign of uh, assimilation to the uh, ambiente, to the place where they lived. Uh, perhaps there are other reasons, but when I did the research, that is what I was told, that it was a result, a consequence, a, a, a reaction to the local environment in which these people lived. You know, I've seen uh, graves uh, and monuments in, in the Caribbean also, where you see pirates oh, yeah. you know, on a grave, something like that. But I've never seen really a monument, and uh, I'll just repeat what I heard that there was a plague or something and a number of children that died. And those little angels are only in the graves of so little children. children, of young children, but, not in general. But, but you know, one has to admire how a small community maintained its identity, notwithstanding assimilationist forces. But eventually, I think they used to come. You, you, you can't... Uh, yes, but... It's amazing. Do you know that there was an itinerant mohel that used to come? Obviously, the, the, the circumcision was not done on the eighth day as it is usually supposed to be done because there was no local mohel. So there was an itinerant mohel that used to come whenever he used to come, and then he would do the circumcision of X number of children that were born from the time he visited at last until he came to visit. And the fact that these parents were ready to bring their children to have the Mila is 
nothing but short of amazing. You know, Rabbi Eisenberg, you remind me with that, that a similar thing happened in our days, in the Soviet Union. There used to be a more, an itinerant more done in secret. Sure. They are done in secret sure. without yeah. knowing. You know, Rabbi Eisenberg, I'd like to jump a little bit. You're a historian, so we can go from one epoch to another. Absolutely. You, after you left uh, Venezuela, you went to the United States. You served for 30 years, I understand, yes. as a rabbi. And from what I know, you were very successful in Venezuela. I hope so. so. I inf no, I know so. <laughs> I infer that you were equally successful in the United States in your synagogue. But uh, the hundreds or thousands of rabbis, so I don't want to say you were one more, but you were a distinguished rabbi, I have no doubt. Of. But you did something else. You had other work that had to do with the Shoah, with the Holocaust, that is really the most tragic episode in the entire history of the Jewish people. What did you do? I was fortunate that soon after my retirement from the congregation, uh, I was invited to become the scholar in residence at the Queensboro Community College, which is part of the City University of New York in Queens. And that particular college is uh, particular because they are, most of the students that study there are not born, or at least the parents are not born in the United States. In fact, there are 104 nationalities represented in the college. A United Nations. A, on, on a campus in Queens, New York. And uh, I was given the privilege to teach about the Shoah to students from so many nationalities, I had never imagined that I would speak about the Shoah to students from Ghana, from Burkina Faso, from Ecuador, from, from Brazil, from you name it. They were there from Muslim countries. Did they challenge you? No, they were. Did they to, challenge the veracity of what no, you were telling? No, to my amazement, they were very interested as an example for their own experiences to similar events that had happened in many of their own countries. Not in the magnitude that we know of, of the Shoah, which cannot be compared to anything else, but they could find similarities of dictatorships, of, of oppression, of genocides that had taken place in their own countries, and therefore they identified with what I was telling them and trying to find ways of how we as Jews have taken the, the Shoah and have made it so much part of our conscience, of our being, of who we are, and trying to perpetuate the memory of those who so tragically were murdered. You know, Rabbi Eisenberg, I think that is a very important, meritorious type of work because we are witness today to many people who challenge the veracity, the authenticity of what happened, those that don't want to assume responsibility. The Austrians, for instance, never came forth. And right now, the Poles have a little bit of discussion, whitewashing, and we all know that there was a pogrom after the war that happened in Poland. But that's not the point. I think it's very important that those people that attended your classes saw and learned about what happened, and they brought it back to their different countries. You said so many different countries, especially today when Iran tries to negate and I say that this really didn't happen. I think this was a tremendous piece of work that you did. And Right now, who knows who is watching us now? I think it's very important that the people who watch us now should also learn about the greatest tragedy that happened to the Jewish people. A third of Jews were exterminated during the Second World. Rabbi Eisenberg, I want to thank, thank you, you very, very much, much for taking thank our time. You. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very glad much. that we met again in Miami in our retirement uh, years, my and pleasure. we can still remember. My the good old times, and there'll be good times in the future. Amen. Amen. The Holocaust Amen. should not be forgotten, but we must look at the future. Amen. We must look at it. Thank, Thank you, you so you much. Thank you very much. Thank you.